Jenny. The cool thing about Jenny, our own building, uh, Jenny has volunteered to uh, have a dunk tank, and she will be in it in the, uh, the lobby. So that's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> no, not so good cream, Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, friends. Well, I hope this series uh, has been challenging to you. If anything, I hope something has stuck into your head about it. Whether it was to love your neighbor when you go outside and you look to your left and right in the street. Maybe when you uh, think about uh, loving your enemy or forgiving your enemy or uh, being angry, as Mark talked about last week. Did he do an okay job or do I need to have another chat with him? Heck yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that where you're booing? Uh, no, you're still on the list. So. Keep up the good work, so I appreciate that. I tried, Mark. Uh, but this is the last. Uh, this is the last message tonight. So really, gonna bring it all, all around. So, but really, I hope uh, I, I know. Um, you know. I'm thinking about my neighbor, and I'm gonna take one of those VBS things and walk over to that. I got young kids. You know, this works in your schedule. We'd love to have you there. Uh, and let me tell you, uh, talk real quick too about it. Um, on our registration that we've been doing online, which there's about almost 20 kids already. So we're, we think 30 would be great. I'm thinking 50. Is what we're going to end up with. Because VBS, the uh, way you do VBS, the first day you have this many kids, the next day you have more kids. Isn't that right? And then the last day you have the most kids. So, um, but I put a place on there that says, uh, parents, are you planning on staying or, or, or not during the VBS? Because some, being in a park, I thought some might drop their kids off and then hang around. And uh, so what we're going to do actually for parents, we want to make connections. That's what this is about. Uh, the kids will have fun and enjoy but for the parents and that's why even if you can come and just hang out connect with the parents is what we're really trying to do uh, we're going to make like a little vip place for the parents where there's some you know water and a place they can sit we might even have some discussions you know like about technology and your kids or um, you know uh, different parenting advice and stuff like that uh, to kind of engage them during that time as well so this is kind of a, a whole family thing so kind of keep that in mind uh, so whether you come down for the two hours or one hour or you know you, you will be put to use you will be put to use for sure so um, that's kind of one thing i want to drop so all right i wish jesus hadn't said that and today uh, like i said uh, we, we had the last supper he went to his death and his resurrection and then he showed himself and he was talking to his disciples and a couple other people actually on this mountain and he said you need to go and make disciples that's what we're going to look at. I wish Jesus hadn't said, go and make a disciple. Because that means, as followers of Jesus, we have to do something. Right? He said, go and make disciples. He didn't say, sit, sit around and think about it. He didn't say, go on Sundays for an hour and make disciples. It was just simply, go and make disciples. Now, if you're introverted at all, this statement scares you. doesn't it? Right? It sends us out of our comfort zone that we're going to have to talk to somebody about our faith. So, quick informal poll here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me phrase this correctly. If you... When was the last time you talked to someone about Christ? Right? You mentioned it in a conversation or encouraged somebody uh, to do. Uh, was it uh, a week ago? Did anybody in the last week talk to someone about Christ? Uh, how about within the last month? How about the last six months? Come on, raise your hand. Don't sit there and not. Raise your hand. Come on. It's being active, right? right? And, you know, think about that. Because he gave us a commandment. And that's what we're going to look at. That we have to go and make disciples. And so that's why this is the last one of I wish he hadn't said that. Uh, you know what? A lot of churches will think, Whose job is it to go and make disciples? The pastor. Pastor, right? Oh no, it doesn't say that in their friends, does it? Hey, pastor, go and make disciples. This is for anyone that follows Jesus. Um, so this is what we're really going to talk about. So Matthew 28 is where we're going to be. So uh, if you got your Bible, you got your app, get to Matthew 28. And uh, we'll look at just a couple verses here. I bet this little speech was maybe a minute long, but... This is where it all comes to, right here. All right, so he was up on a mountain. This was after his resurrection. He's talking to uh, his disciples and some other uh, people who were around there too. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given.
given to you. Stop right there for a second. So who gave Jesus that authority? Where is this coming from? God. This is a God record. Coming from him. Verse 19, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So there you have it, friends. That's what he said. It didn't take long, but it's extremely powerful and for us. A lot of messages and sermons you give at churches don't really apply to the people sitting in the church, right? <clears throat> this one does. This one could apply more because Jesus was talking to the people following him. So what I want you to say, because this is the way we learn stuff, is when I say go, I want you to add an and make disciples. So Jesus said for us to go and make disciples. If you don't say it strong enough, and, and like you should have said, I will say it again, but that was a good one, so I'm going to let you off the hook. Sounds good? Woo! But be ready, because we're going to say it a lot. You see, again, so Jesus was on a mountain, and so this, I would consider it a mountaintop moment for Jesus. He's up there, and this wasn't the only time that Jesus talked from a mountain. And that's kind of cool, because when you think about your own mountaintop moments, when God was really rocking your life, it was awesome. And you were on cloud nine. Have you ever had that before? Yeah, that's where Jesus was when he did this. And, and if you think about it, if we do what Jesus was talking about on this mountaintop moment, we just might end up living a mountaintop life. Am I right? Right? So he, he did his sermon on the mountain. He showed up with Moses and Jacob, I think, on the mountain, right? And then here again, we see Jesus again on the mountaintop. And what he did at this time was he brought us into this game. And we're expected to play a part. Again, it was a commandment that said, go and make disciples. There was nothing ambiguous about it. He couldn't have been more straightforward about this. We are expected to play a part. And, and I don't know if you notice this, but in worship and church, I love to be interactive and active. I'm not a passive person. I don't like when people are sitting and going up. God said, or Jesus said here, get into the game. We'll be part of it. So when I say go, hey, make disciples. you are now active, aren't you? You're no longer passive. Is that a good teaching strategy or what? Great. But we are brought into the game to think about that. He has really... Uh, he, he taught us, he showed his disciples, and then he, he brought us all into the game. Not just the pastor, but all of us into the game, right? And you see, Jesus is telling us that we, that the kingdom of God will come, and his will will be done, and we get to be a part of all of that happening. That's pretty exciting. When we get to the end of life, friends, we have two options. We get heaven, we get Pittsburgh. <laughs> I said Michigan this morning, they really did. But right? We get two options. We get heaven or we get that. And we get to help people decide what that's going to be for them. Our friends, our family, our enemies. Isn't it we want everyone to know the love of Jesus Christ? Isn't that what it's about? And by knowing that, we get the opportunity to spend eternity together in a big party. Live that mountaintop life. Have an opportunity to change someone's life. God will work through you. God does the transformation. But it's just not going to happen for people standing around waiting. It's going to happen when we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's pause that just for a second. So we just got back from vacation last night. I had, like uh, somebody said, I was doing a, uh, a pastor class. Um, Friday and Saturday in Columbus. That's a great way to wrap up a vacation. But uh, I have one class left. Yeah. So we're going to have a party when I'm done with that class, so you're all invited, just so you know. All invited. Uh, but we went on vacation. Uh, so we just got back from vacation. And uh, so I asked a question on Facebook uh, this week, a couple questions. And the question was, where do you take family and friends when they visit Stark County? Uh, I don't know if you follow me on Facebook, that thing lit up the scoreboard. Bing, 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 bing. And we've got all these uh, these um, these uh, options of where to go. Amish country, um, uh, let's see, somebody put camp on the key, somebody put a uh, uh, pro football thing, uh, 
Boston, Hades, you know, all these places, Taggart's, uh, those places where you have to see somebody can put new way. I deleted it. Um, but it came fast and furious. Um, so when we went on vacation, but we basically did the same thing. We put a lot of effort and thought into where are we going when we get there? What are we going to go see? So if you uh, will allow me, let me share a few of my vacation pictures with you. Is that okay? All right, our first stop was Nashville. I was going to show you that again, so I thought it'd be polite. Our first stop was Nashville, and this building looks like either a cat or a bat. <laughs> or maybe Megatron, I'm not sure. But you, you see that when you come into Nashville. This thing rises out of the earth, and it's uh, kind of intimidating. Uh, but the street in front of it is where I wanted to take my family. It's called Broadway Street in Nashville. Uh, you walk through there, all the restaurants and bars and saloons have somebody better than the, the previous person singing. These bands are playing and music fills the street. Has anyone been to Nashville on the street? Uh, this is where I got my tattoo at a church conference. Seemed like a good thing to do. So. <laughs> that tattoo shop's no longer in business, though. It's now a boot store. Oh, that was disappointing. But they were very nice. We walked, we walked in and, uh, and talked to them. But, so we just spent one night there. We um, got there before dusk. We walked around a little bit. Um, but that was, that was what we wanted to see there. All right, and then next we uh, moved to Memphis. And my son Mason said, hey, let's go to Memphis and let's look at this thing. This is the Bass Pro Shops Pyramid. You don't see it as you enter into Memphis. You don't see Memphis as you enter into Memphis. You come around this corner, like we're like 500 feet away from it. You come around this corner, and there this uh, uh, this pyramid comes out of uh, the horizon, and, it, and it's awesome. Inside of it, uh, it's not glass. You can't actually like, see outside of it. It's like a forest. It has ponds, has big fish, it has a couple restaurants. Bowling alley. Um, it's like Cabela's on steroids. Which, by the way, did you hear that Bass Pro bought out Cabela's? We were, we were liking Cabela's when we heard that, so that was weird. But, um, so we really enjoyed this place. Uh, the, the, uh, engineers and architects have weird minds. Let me just put it that way. Because you walk into this building, and there is a glass elevator in the middle of it that goes up 32 stories. Is that not disgusting, friends? I got on it and I shut my eyes. I saw this little girl watching me. Shut up. You'll be this way in a few years. <laughs> but if you look right here, right here, this is the, the sick part. Somebody put an observation deck there with the glass floor. And my kids had to go on it. So I was a responsible adult went up with them, although I was not stepping on that glass floor. But, uh, but that's the scene that, so when they looked down, of course they were up right on the, uh, on the fence, you know, looking over. Mason wanted to know if he could slide down the side of the pyramid. I really discouraged that. <laughs> but uh, amazing views, and that was pretty cool uh, to be there. So that, that was our, our first stop in Memphis. We went there, and then, uh, then we went to a place called the Peabody Hotel. You heard of this place? They have ducks that are famous. It was free, too, so that was really cool. But we got there, look, the place was filled. Uh, uh, they talk and they're super friendly. All the kids there, we got down front, and the elevator opens up, and this guy with the cane walks out. And then a few seconds later, five ducks follow him. And they walk right down the red carpet, and they hopped in that little fountain right there. And they swam around. That was it. But it was a quick thing they do that twice a day. So, so that was something we saw. Then we went to lunch at a place called Huey's. Huey's uh, was kind of fun because we got to take our toothpicks and shoot them into the seal. <laughs> they said, be careful, sometimes the toothpicks fall into your food. That didn't happen to us, but that might be a different experience. So, uh, so when we get our new place, I think this is a tradition we should start with. You take a dry straw with one of those frilly uh, toothpicks, you know, and you just blow really hard and it sticks to the seal. <laughs> Atmosphere, right? It has atmosphere. Then I took my people, my family, to the cemetery. Why not? We're in Memphis. Thank you. Uh, but this particular place I, uh, I found, um, uh, in the 1930s, the guy in charge of the cemetery, they said, hey, we want to make this a, a nicer place, but what can you do? And so he dug 60 feet into the uh, earth, and he made a cave, 
and then he did all of this uh, himself. He made the pillars, he used uh, quartz, I think, in crystal. Uh, and all of these uh, um, stations of art, some were made with stone, some were made with wood, they all took, they took their whole life of Jesus. So it was pretty cool. He walked in, he started on the left, and there's about 10 or 12 of them. Zacchaeus was up in the tree. It was really cool. The last one was the, the empty tomb with a laid out of it and an angel sitting there. And it was really cool. It was free to this house. Then we went over to the Civil Rights Museum. This is the hotel and that place where the white rapers were Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Whew. Talk about a powerful time. And it's and it looks like they preserved the blocks all around it. When you drive through there, it looks like you're in 1960. Uh, there's hardly any cars. You almost feel like you're on a movie set. It was really strange. But we actually got to walk, uh, not on the balcony, but they preserved the room he uh, stayed in, and then the next room, and they kind of cut out a middle piece, and, and you got to look at both of them. Where he died, and, uh, and it, was, it was cool. Um, Jennifer's hometown was actually one of part of the Brown First Board of Education, uh, because the, there was a segregation issues in that town. The black family wanted to go to a white school, and that was part of that whole story. And that was in there, so that was really cool to see them. Really enjoyed that. Then there's a place called Bell Street, which is like Broadway in Nashville, but it's more bluesy and a lot rougher. A lot rougher. So um, you can see how close my family is standing towards me in that picture. <laughs> really close to me on that, but it was a fun time too. We you know, walked through there quickly and, uh, <laughs> and uh, but you know what, we put a lot of effort into our vacation. And when I asked Facebook about things, they had a lot of suggestions, right? A lot of effort. What about church? What about church? We put a lot of effort into inviting people to church to be part you know, of that. But, and, and you know, what about Jesus? We put the effort we do in the rest of our life into sharing our life about Jesus. The, the, the person that can actually transform and do something different in our life is Jesus. We put that effort in there. Because we were told to go. And this world, now than ever, needs us to go. I follow Barna. Barna had a poll come out this week. Take a look at this. I would say shocking. I would say the top 10 most post-Christian cities in America. Post-Christian means that no longer is Christianity the main religion practiced. America, my friends, is post-Christian. It's no longer, uh, America is no longer Christian uh, majority. Right? Now, what they did for this study is they looked at how much are you reading the Bible? How much are you praying? Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe God? Uh, do you go to church? They put all that together. And, and the results came out. Um, here it is, the top ten. Now take a look. Um, if you just notice the dots in the top right, uh, there's the names of the cities, but the dots in the top right, we're talking about foundational uh, states made in places when, when America was discovered, for a better word, right? Where, where the missionaries came to plant cities based on a Christian foundation are now the eight of the top ten post-Christian you see the trend I'm getting at, friends? You see it? You know, trends in America go from right to left. They sweep the country, don't they? All right, so we're looking at Maine, New Hampshire, New York, um, Connecticut. We have uh, out here uh, Washington and uh, California. But, but those those in the top, you know, not Bible Belt, but they were pretty pretty important piece of voting in America. Now, if you look through the whole list of out of 100, Greater Canton, Akron, Cleveland area is 52 on that list. So do you think Jesus' command is important today? Now more than ever, friends. Now more than ever. Is this community, this country, seeking uh, something to fill their life? And they're seeking in bars. They're seeking in relationships. They're seeking in money. But they're missing a piece of it. They see what they need to find it in Jesus. So, so Jesus said, go, make disciples. You see, sometimes we're very eager to help people in every aspect of their life, except their faith. Except their faith. 
put me aside up for me. We are eager to help people in every aspect of their life accept their faith. And I only say that because of a couple of posts I put on this week, and I kind of wanted to test my theory, and that's what I found. You see, the first post was, if you had someone from out of town, where would you take them? Uh, within 20 minutes, I, I had 10 plus comments. I mean, it went fast. Boom, boom, boom. And before that, I asked, if you're a church-going person, who invited you? It took 21 hours to reach the same amount of comments. 21 hours. So, so we see this thing. And, and then uh, a big post from this week was a perfectly toasted marshmallow that got 135 likes. So. Well, it was pretty good. It, it, was nice it, it was a nice marshmallow, and it tasted just as good as it looked. But do you, do you see the importance of why Jesus said, go and make disciples, right? We see the trends happening in America. We have people all around us who are struggling in life. And it makes us maybe a little uncomfortable or a little cautious to step out of our comfort zone. But Jesus is saying, do it. And at the very end, he said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So this great theologian said, Jesus wants us to be in community with each other, to live, to love, and learn together. And we can't do that sitting home on our couch every Sunday. I said that. <laughs> I said that person. Put this on your Facebook wall. Encourage people, challenge people. Life is more than about sitting home on the couch. All by yourself. We've got to live together. That's what Jesus wants. Where would you be today if someone invited you to church and to know Jesus? What would life be like? Would it be a wreck? Would it be okay? We know what it is now that we're here. I, I love it. I enjoy it. You see, all my life I've had people beside me living that and go and make disciples companion. Thank goodness, because as soon as I might start straying a little bit from church, there's somebody there saying, hey, you're a good guy. You love Jesus. Get back. Thank you. I had a, a, a family all around me my whole life. Really. When I got to college, I had a professor who just was an awesome guy, right? Then, then, I, then outside of college, getting into work, I've got people all around me constantly moving out this go and make disciples. Awesome thing. Now, if we did this, I don't know how you want to call this a challenge, but if one person, each of us reached one person in the street, what would, you, what would that do to our church and our community? It would blow up in a good way. It would cause a whole lot more problems that we would be to solve. We would have kids hanging out the windows. Our air conditioning wouldn't be able to keep up because there'd be so many people in here. We'd have to go from two services to three, maybe four, and I'm totally okay with that. I'd be ecstatic if we could do that. But it's all of us, right? Jesus said, go and make disciples. So maybe we wish he hadn't said that, and we didn't think about it, and I'm tired. I don't have the energy. It was a bad week, but I'm really glad. I'm really glad you did. There's only one thing that's going to change this world. That's the love of God. The peace of God. And, and God's going to use all of us. He's going to speak through us. We're here. Jesus is watching everything. But He's going to take us. And we're going to put us in people's lives, put us in people's paths. And we're going to say, hey, you got to come to church with me. You're going to love it there. People will love on you like never before. That's what we tell people all the time. Anyway, people just love on you. They're just wonderful. They don't go. We just come in and we're, we're part of us. It's great. We're, it's wonderful. Come on. You know, somebody who's going through a rough time in life, that's exactly what they need. They need a place where they can come and sit down, have a cup of coffee, and figure out what the heck is going on. And Jesus said, we did that. We get to do that. We have to do that. Jesus said, go. Jesus said, go. And Jesus said, go. Let's have a word of prayer, friends. God, we thank you. We thank you for today. Maybe we're tired. Maybe we're energetic. But we thank you for today. And, and God, thank you for putting that commandment out there. The commandment that we must follow. The commandment that we must do. Jesus, sometimes it might make us uncomfortable or, or out of our comfort zone. But, but we know you're going to be with us. We know you're going to put us in places where we can practice this and do this. And Lord, if there's anything we know, then you can change life. 
that you have the power to do that. Let us hold on to that piece, piece of our faith and believe with everything we have. And know that you will be with us and that you will change lives and you will change this world. God, use us. Put us, put us where you need us to be. Have us say the things we need to say and act in the way we need to act for. Uh, we've got a big opportunity this week. Next week, come up with our BBS. We, we pray all over this, God. We just know that you've set it up before we work me. And now we get to go and move this up. We put all this before you. Put it in our hearts, put it in our minds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.